Morning everyone. I'm Russell and I like hats. Hi Russell. So um, today we're going to head up north and um, talk about a writer from Canada. His name is Robertson Davies. This is uh, the Deptford Trilogy which was um, one of his more popular books. Uh, it's a trilogy, obviously. Um, I discovered Davies, uh, What's Bread in the Bone was the first book I read by him. And uh, not long after that, I discovered this trilogy. Um, there's three books in it, <laughs> obviously. Fifth Business, The Manticore, and World of Wonders. Davies was a character, I think he must have been a very interesting man to know. He was a playwright and sometimes actor. He was a professor for many years. He was fascinated by psychology. And much of this book, uh, much of these three books, uh, centers around his interest in psychology and also theater. Uh, a lot of the story takes place in theater companies, magic there's a lot of magic and myth involved. Um, but he, Davies was just a really playful, um, funny writer. But he also had that depth of, um, you know, exploring the human psyche. So I think you'll see pretty quickly here that he has a wonderful way of bringing his characters to life. This is the chapter one from Fifth Business. And it's titled Mrs. Dempster. <clears throat> My lifelong involvement with Mrs. Dempster began at 5.58 o'clock p.m. on 27th of December 1908, at which time I was 10 years and 7 months old. I'm able to date the occasion with complete certainty because that afternoon... I had been sledding with my lifelong friend and enemy, Percy Boyd Staunton, and we had quarreled because his fine new Christmas sled would not go as fast as my old one. Snow was never heavy in our part of the world, but this Christmas it had been plentiful enough almost to cover the tallest spears of dried grass in the fields. In such snow, his sled with its tail runners and foolish steering apparatus was clumsy and apt to stick whereas my low-slung old affair would almost have, have slid on grass without snow. The afternoon had been humiliating for him, and when Percy was humiliated, he was vindictive. His parents were rich, his clothes were fine, and his mittens were of skin and came from a store in the city, whereas mine were knitted by my mother. It was manifestly wrong, therefore, that his splendid sled should not go faster than mine, and when such injustice showed itself, Percy became cranky. He slighted my sled, scoffed at my mittens, and at last came right out and said that his, fa his father was better than my father, instead of hitting him, which might have started a fight that could have ended in a draw or even a defeat for me, I said, all right, then, I could go home, and he could have the field to himself. This was crafty of me, for I knew it was getting on for supper time, and one of our home rules was that nobody under any circumstances was to be late for a meal. So I was keeping the home rule while at the same time leaving Percy to himself. As I walked back to the village, he followed me, shouting fresh insults. When I walked, he taunted I staggered like an old cow. My woolen cap was absurd beyond all belief. My backside was immense and wobbled when I walked. <clears throat> and more of the same sort, for his invention was not lively. I said nothing, because I knew that his, this spited him more than any retort, and that every time he shouted at me, he lost space. Our village was so small that you came on it at once. It lacked the dignity of outskirts. I darted up our street putting on speed, for I had looked ostentatiously at my new Christmas dollar watch. Percy had a watch, but was not let wear it because it was too good, and saw that it was 5.57. Just time to get, my, to get indoors, wash my hands in the noisy, splashy way my parents seemed to like, and be in my place at six, my head bent for grace. Percy was by this time hopping mad, and I knew that I had spoiled his supper and probably his whole, whole evening. 
Then the unforeseen took over. Walking up the street ahead of me were the Reverend Amasa Dempster and his wife. He had her arm tucked in his and was leaning towards her in the protective way he had. I was familiar with this sight, for they always took a walk at this time, after dark and when most people were at supper, because Mrs. Dempster was going to have a baby, and it was not the custom in our village for pregnant women to show themselves boldly in the streets, not if they had any position to keep up, and of course the Baptist minister's wife had a position. Percy had been throwing snowballs at me from time to time, and I had ducked them all. I had a boy's sense of when a snowball was coming, and I knew Percy. I was sure that he would try to land one last insulting snowball between my shoulders before I ducked into our house. I stepped briskly, not running but not dawdling, in front of the Dempsters just as Percy threw and the snowball hit Mrs. Dempster on the back of the head. She gave a cry and, clinging to her husband, slipped to the ground. He might have caught her if he, if he had not turned at once to see who had thrown the snowball. I had meant to dart into our house. But I was unnerved by hearing Mrs. Dempster. I had never heard an adult cry in pain before, and the sound was terrible to me. Falling, she burst into nervous tears, and suddenly there she was, on the ground with her husband kneeling beside her, holding her in his arms and speaking to her in terms of endearment that were strange and embarrassing to me. I had never heard married people, or any people, speak unashamedly loving words before. I knew that I was watching a scene, and my parents had always warned against scenes as very serious breaches of propriety. I stood gaping, and when Mr. Dempster became conscious of me, Dunny, Dunny, he said, I did not knew, know he knew my name, lend us your sleigh to get my wife home. I was contrite and guilty, for I knew that the snowball had been meant for me, but the dumpsters did not seem to think of that. He lifted his wife on my sled, which was not hard because she was a small, girlish woman, and as I pulled it towards their house, he walked beside it, very awkward, awkwardly bent over her, supporting her and uttering soft endearment and encouragement, for she went on crying like a child. Their house was not far away, just around the corner, really, but by the time I had been there and seen Mrs. Mr. Dempster take his wife inside and found myself unwanted inside, it was a few minutes after six and I was late for supper. But I pelted home, pausing only for a moment at the scene of the accident, washed my hands, slipped into my place at my table, and made my excuse looking straight into my mother's sternly interrogative eyes. I gave my story a slight historical bias leaning firmly but not absurdly on my own role as the Good Samaritan. I suppressed any information or guesswork about where the snowball had come from, and to my relief, my mother did not pursue that aspect of it. She was much more interested in Mrs. Dempster, and when, when supper was over and the dishes, dishes washed, she told my father she thought she would just step over to the Dempsters and see if there was anything she could do. Fifth Business by Robertson Davies. Have a great day.